satu. Oh, it's a lovely satu. Got to go. Yes. No dog can sit for a long time, yeah. even in the police dog trials, they're only really? supposed to sit for two minutes. Are they? I yes, know sitting that. is a very, very uncomfortable. Barbara, you're not a new face to the island. How often have you been here before? Well, we all spent a holiday with the children here for a fortnight, and I've been over two or three times because, of course, my son lives here. He was married here. And uh, I have a great affection for it because, of course, I kept Guernseys myself in England for 21 years. This was during the war, wasn't it? Uh, oh, after the war, yes. During the war, I kept them in a town where I hadn't even got a cow shed. I just kept them in people's gardens and provided the milk, the, all the milk for the babies in the town. And uh, after that, I ran a proper farm. I had 17 cows and two bulls, and I came over here to buy one. And um, uh, I have a great affection for them. Of course, my trouble was I hand milked. So when I went on holiday, I had to take the cows with me because I couldn't leave them behind. I think that's the first time anybody's ever gone to the seaside with their cows. They all took their bucket and spade with them, did they? Oh, well, one had a calf and played on the beach. Yes, it was great fun. But um, normally, of course, um, I had to stay with them all the time. I never got a really proper holiday except that one when I took them for 21 years because, you see, nowadays it's all... Uh, machines, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But what uh, did happen to my cows, which I suppose not many people do, is when they uh, didn't have any more calves and they're no longer giving milk, I saddled them up and took them out for rides. Did they oh, really like know. this? Oh, they loved it. They didn't have bridles on. They had saddles on, just head collars. My daughter rode a pony and I, I rode a cow and they loved it. Why shouldn't they see the countryside? Why should they be stuck to one old paddock all the time? A lot of people know you for your, your dog training more than anything else, but you were taught in an agricultural college, weren't you? You're, oh, yes. you're a farmer by trade more than anything. Yes, uh, yes. farmer by wish, I think. And uh, I took to dog training when I had to give up cows, you see, eventually, because the rules and regulations about milk nowadays in England are very, very difficult. And uh, I took up uh, dog training professionally. And uh, it's amazing how quickly you can train a dog. I roughly, uh, I hope to be able to train a dog roughly in six minutes in the basic obedience if you give the right commands, use the right choke chain, which is absolutely vital. Too many people use these thin ones, which are very cruel. And uh, you claim to have a special telepathy with animals, don't you? Well, the other day South Africa rang me and asked me if I'd test out if they put dogs by the telephone and I gave them commands, would the dogs obey me? So I did and they all obeyed me. And then, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, the same uh, boat, um, Sydney rang me. Now that's 16,000 miles away from where I live, and all the dogs obeyed me in Sydney too. So it shows that if you think about it and give the right commands, the animals will, in fact, do as you say. Now you also um, teach people how to look after their animals, don't you? We've got a little puppy here who's making a lot of noise. Yes, well he's He's a little bit disturbed, isn't he? But his master's over there, do you see? And obviously he wants to go to it, but he shouldn't be allowed really to make this noise. If I'd had a little choke chain on him, I would have given him a, a jerk and said, stop it. So how do you care for a puppy when they're so young? You know, a lot of people will buy a puppy and they, they won't really know how to handle them if they haven't been brought up with animals. Well, the main thing is to train them from about eight weeks old and not to let the children rough and tumble them because that makes them bad tempered. And uh, you want to give them plenty of rest. People are inclined to, to take them too long walks and they get upset, you know, because they, they get overtired and then they start nipping. I think he wants to go to his master. Shall I let him go? Poor little dog, he wants to run to his master. Go on, darling. There you are. He, um, he's very fond of his master, isn't he? Mm. Now you're going to, <laughs> that's right. Well, the main thing is, of course, uh, not to tire them, uh, to give them three or four meals a day when they're tiny, and then cut them to two, and never take them for long exercise until they're about four to five months old, and big dogs six months old, because otherwise their bones are too, you know, suffer with a Great Dane, for example. We don't take them for proper walks till six months old. Give them plenty of calcium and things, and generally mix them with a lot of people so they get to know people, socialize them. Otherwise, you'll find that some dogs like German Shepherds could bite, you know, by being frightened, nervous, an awful lot of nervous mm. dogs in the countries today. Mm. Now, you were, you were brought up in Ireland for the first nine years of your life. Yes. Would, when was the period when you realised that you, you had a special affinity with animals then? Oh, always. When I was two, we had in Ireland, my father was headmaster of a boys' public school, and we had all the army horses in the First World War uh, put into the park where the college was. And uh, my n n old nanny always was losing me. The other children were good, I wasn't, and I was always found amongst the feet of these enormous great army horses in the park, age about two. And when I was about four, I went down to a stable one day and tried to harness up our pony that used to go in the pony trap for a drive every afternoon. And there was I, holding this enormous collar, sitting on him and trying to get it over his head, age about four. 
But what always staggered me was the way my mother trusted me with animals. Our governess came from Dundrum, which was five miles from the college, and every day I was put in this pony trap and drove this pony five miles all by myself, age five, down to the station, met my governess and came back. Well, I mean, I could have been run away with or anything, but mother never, never worried with animals. And I always remember one day the station master at Oxford, where we lived after we left Ireland, uh, ringing up my mother and saying, we've got a very fierce Alsatian in the parcels office, it's lost its lead and nobody can get in the parcels office, would your child come down and catch it? So mother quite happily put me on the bus uh, to go to Oxford, whether she wanted to get rid of me or not, I don't know. But anyway, I went down to the station, I walked into the station, I said, come on old lady, and it came up, wagged its tail, and I put its lead on and handed it back to the owner. I'd never thought of fear, I've never had any fear. And I think this is what matters with animals, don't you think so? It's the affinity and the telepathy. Now, you've, you've made a name for yourself in films as well, training animals, haven't you? Yes, I've made lots of films. I've made over a hundred films and television uh, series and things with my own dogs. And all the dogs in films uh, in about 10, 15 years ago were pupils of mine. I used to just train the dogs for a few minutes and then borrow them from the owners and take them to the film studios and put them through it. Rags was one. He belonged to an old age pensioner and I met him in Rickmansworth where I live. And I knew Pinewood wanted a dog to, to star with John Gregson in Rooney. So I said to this old age pension, I said, how would you like your dog to be a film star? And she said, oh, I got him from Battersea. And he doesn't know anything. He's never been trained. And he's nine years old. Anyway, I had him from, uh, uh, over at the studios for a quarter of an hour. They gave me 13 things for him to do. I was left for another quarter of an hour to teach him. And she got a contract for 300 pounds. I don't think she'd ever had 300 pounds in her life. And the film was lovely. The dog did everything that was wanted. The animals are very clever. I know when you're acting in films, or dogs are anyway, that the rehearsals and everything, it's the, only, it's the people that forget their words, not the dogs that forget their actions. But it's not just dogs that have acted in films, you've got some cows that have acted as well, haven't you? Oh, yes, my cow Snow Queen acted with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in The Charm. And she had a star part because it was written all about a Guernsey cow. And uh, she was very well trained. She'd go through Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire into a pub by herself, according to the film script, and drink beer and come out. And the studios were absolutely ruled by Snow Queen. When I said she had to um, chew her cud, they'd built her a corral and they, all the shooting stopped and she lay down and chewed her cud for a few minutes. And then another cow acted in Heights of Danger. They'd been seven weeks in Austria trying to film this racing car sequence where a cow holds up this race because it won't get out of the road, you see. And they couldn't do it, and they came home to England. And I just told my cow to walk in the road and go and lick the headlamps of this racing car and stop it. She did it straight away. All I did was put a little treacle on the lamp, of course, and she went straight up and, and licked it. You've got to know what interests animals and of course 90 percent of uh, acting can be done with animals that are not trained like the cows weren't trained with food it's the same with cats uh, people say cats can't be trained of course they can but a little bribery and corruption goes a long way with a cat now you 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 are a woman of many talents because you you taught ballroom dancing didn't you oh, yes i used to have a riding school and taught riding all day and ballroom dancing all night my sister ran a dancing school so I went and helped her, and I taught all sorts of people, like Dingle and Michael Foote, and all sorts were of people. Were they any good? Dingle was excellent, but I, Michael had to be taught a little bit more. <laughs> so, what are you planning to do now? You seem to have done everything possible in your life no. to handle animals. Is there something no, else? No, Yes, I'm going to do a series on horses, because most of my life in the early days were spent with horses. I used to break in the horses in the Argentine for Liebig's Extractor Meat Company at 10 bob a head, break my neck or break the horse. And I was taught a lovely trick by the Guarani Indians of breathing up their noses, and they never do any harm, so it's not really clever at all. You just breathe up a horse's nose, and it's your friend for life, and then you get on. And people think it's very clever, but it isn't. It's just knowing how to talk to animals in their own language. So you've got plenty of plans for the future? Oh, yes. I, I, I'm just sort of starting life at 70. I'm not ending it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. No, but that was nice, wasn't it? <laughs>